So thank you everybody for joining um, our AMD webinar. This is our second webinar this year. We had one in June and we're very excited about this particular webinar. We feel it's a topic that is of uh, huge interest to members of Fighting Blindness and also anyone really affected by AMD. And we have a great lineup of speakers um, this evening. So just some housekeeping things. Um, like I said, welcome to everybody joining. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website. A link will also be sent in an email to anyone that has signed up and is in attendance this evening. Um, so questions can be submitted through the Q&A box. Um, these are only sent to the host and they can be submitted anonymously. Um, so the text box option is there. Uh, for people who would like to um, submit their questions. And I know some of you have submitted questions um, before the webinar and we will get to those as well. Um, so I'll stop, or sorry, I actually, I have the agenda here. So uh, first up, we're gonna have Sean, Sean Poland from Vision Sport Ireland. And then we have Tomas Burke, a uh, consultant ophthalmologist at the Matter uh, Public and Private Hospitals. And then we have um, some members of Fighting Blindness, so Martha O'Connor and Catherine Sinnott. And we're going to speak around AMD support. And then I'm going to speak uh, just around, I know there was, we'd sent a link to an AMD, a very short AMD survey. Um, and I'm going to present on some of those findings uh, very briefly at the end. And then there's the Q&A session. Um, so that's the agenda for this evening's um, webinar. So I'll stop sharing there. Um, I see Finbar has joined. Finbar, do you want to say a few words? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, as CEO of Fighting Blindness, um, I want to welcome you all to our webinar on the topic of AMD. Already this year, we had a webinar on the research into different conditions with Foundation mm -hmm. Fighting Blindness and our own team talking about how you can get involved in research. We are excited about the Retina International World Congress next year, and I hope you'll be able to attend the Public Engagement Day in June. 40 years ago, this is a very important year for us, but 40 years ago, Fighting Blindness was formed. Professor Jane Farrar, our first funded researcher who discovered the first gene causing vision loss, last year discovered that the treatment for these conditions, gene therapy, could potentially be used to someday treat AMD. This shows the strength of fighting blindness in this area and clearly demonstrates that investing in rare disease research benefits other conditions as well. We are stronger when we work together and we are part of a global movement advocating for better treatments for all retinal conditions. First to speak to you this evening is Sean Poland, who will talk to you about all of the options to keep fit and stay involved in sports and physical activity. We will then hear from consultant Dr. Tomas Burke about the current treatment of AMD. After that, we will hear from our new head of support, who we are delighted to introduce, Marta O'Connor and Groups Coordinator, Catherine Sinnott, about the range of supports we have to offer and a new announcement around AMD supports. Finally, our research team will introduce a survey on AMD, which I hope you will complete, and to talk about getting more involved in research. We will finally have a Q&A session, and I would encourage you to take part if you have any questions whatsoever. Thank you so much for joining this evening. It's really well attended, so we're really delighted for that. And I hope you will find the webinar useful and that you stay involved in our community. Thank you. Thanks very much, Finbar. Um, my own name is Sean Poland. I work with Vision Sports Ireland. Um, a little fact about myself, I have Stargardt macular degeneration, so quite similar to AMD in the symptoms, different cause. Um, my role within Vision Sports Ireland is education and training coordinator, where I look after educating and training coaches, volunteers, uh, parents and family members about how to include people with a vision impairment into sport, whether that be blind and vision impaired specific or mainstream sports. Um, here this evening, I'm going to find a call to talk about activities and resources and how to get involved in physical activity, whether that be with uh, in vision sports or in your local community. So I'm going to share a, a short presentation and give some audio description throughout. 
as to what is on screen. So I just want to share screen at the moment. So to start, I put together a collage of a couple of images um, of some of the different sports that we offer with Envision Sports Ireland. One being in tandem cycling, where we have two gentlemen up on a tandem bike cycling through a parkland. We also have a young gentleman and a young lady going for a run together using a tether. So this will be where a guide runner will guide someone who has very low to no vision. Again, this is also through a parkland. We see trees and grasslands around them. And on the bottom right, we have an image of a sailing boat, which takes place at our flagship event, Mayfest, which takes place every year in Dublin. This so happened to be the pier in Dunleary, where we had sailing for our members. Who are Vision Sports and what do we do? So Vision Sports Ireland is the national and governing body for blind and vision impaired sport in Ireland. We were founded in 1988 um, and we look after people of all levels of fitness, whether it be sport and recreational opportunities. And most specifically, I just want to say they are opportunities of your choice. Um, so if there's activities that we don't run, feel free to get in contact of any sport you wish, and we will do our utmost to ensure that you can enjoy those sports also, along with the list that we currently have running. So why get active? What are the benefits of being active? Why should I get active and what should I do? Um, so I suppose it enhances thinking, learning and judgment skills. It also increases your cardio respiratory fitness. So both between your heart and your lungs. Um, it decreases the symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, it's very good for your bone health, your bone density, reducing falls and maintaining a healthy BMI or body mass index. On the screen here, we have an image of two people going for a walk um, throughout the mountains. Um, and that's sort of incorporating what we want in Vision Sports Ireland is activities that you can do, whether people are a family member or a club, activities that you enjoy. On the next screen, um, how active should I be is the title of this screen. So not everybody knows how much physicality they should be having. Um, sometimes we, we hope that we're doing enough, but we mightn't be too sure. So on screen at the minute, we have an image of two ladies going for what looks like a brisk walk. Um, again, through a nice parkland. So 41% of the Irish population currently meet their physical activity guidelines. And this is reported by Sport Ireland in the Sport Ireland uh, or Sport Monitor report. Um, those guidelines were set out by the World Health Organization. Um, and what those guidelines are for adults is 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity per week. Broken down, that is 60 minutes, five days per week. So one hour of moderate intensity aerobic um, work or exercise five days per week. This might be something as simple as a brisk walk. Um, for adults, this also incorporates strength training throughout the week. Um, and there's a misconception that as we get older, we need less physical activity. But it is quite the opposite. As, as we get older, we actually need to keep up our levels of physical activity. So the World Health Organization has stated that over 65s um, should be also be doing both balance and strength training at least three days per week. So that might be something like a yoga class. Um, again, any activities outdoors on uneven ground is very, very good for your balance. And corporate strength training, whether it be gym work or online classes um, into your physical activity programs. So moving on, what sports do vision sports provide? What activities? So I put together a short list of some of the activities that we do. However, we work with over 20 national and governing bodies, which means we provide over 20 different types of sport. But some of the more common ones that people do is our athletics, whether it be throwing or walking, or sorry, <laughs> throwing or track, such as running. So last week we had a very successful athletics program with the youngest Vision Sports member being five and the oldest on the day being 66, going through different running uh, and throwing activities. We have our vision impaired and blind football, um, both competing at national and international levels. We have blind golf. Again, this is run by Irish Blind Golf. Um, if anybody wants to get in contact, feel free to contact ourselves or Irish Blind Golf on this. There's also walking. So there's walking programs. Um, again, this doesn't have to be true vision sports, but we do have walking programs. We, we support one in Cork. We have one in Dublin. We have one in Loud and Galway. 
But if anybody wants to get involved in walk in their community, and maybe you feel that coaches or walk leaders don't understand your vision impairment, we also have education programs, which I will talk about later within this. Next, we have swimming. So we run swimming programs right around the country. Um, one of the more, I suppose, uh, popular ones is with Inclontarf Bats. So you can see some of the images here on screen of people swimming um, outside. We also have images of people playing football, people playing golf, and people tandem cycling, which brings me on to the next sport, tandem cycling. So for anybody who's not familiar with tandem cycling, this is a bike which has two saddles, two sets of handlebars, however, only the front steers. Um, two people on the bike. The first person um, is the stoker. So that's the vision paired and blind stoker. And the second person is the sighted pilot. And they will set the front of the bike steering um, and both parties compete, whether this is out for a casual recreational cycle or if we're competing at a very high level in Paralympics, it is a team and a duo, two people going together. At Vision Sports Ireland, we do have an inventory of tandem bikes. So people would like to loan a tandem bike. This is free of charge and it can be loaded out for a number of months. If you'd like to give it a go, we host come and try cycling events around the country and also training for pilots. Again, I will speak about that later. And lastly, mentioned on this is tennis. The reason why tennis is mentioned is the fastest growing vision impaired and blind sport within Ireland. Um, we had a team competing at the Ipsa World Championships a couple of weeks back um, and again incorporates all age groups from very young um, to very old all the way through um, I suppose your life of sport so if anybody wants to get involved at any stage throughout life if you feel I've never done this before there's come and try days there's 12 clubs all over Ireland I would suggest people get involved it's the fastest growing for a reason very exciting and adaptations made throughout for your different varying levels of vision um, from vision impaired all the way to no vision Next on screen, I have a slide, how to get active. So there's a number of ways to get active, but within Vision Sports Ireland, the first one is to contact Vision Sports Ireland, whether that be any member of the team over the phone, through email, on a website, or through social media. Um, we're happy to help. That's what we're here for, is to make sure that you're getting your physical activity of your choice, whichever activity it is that you would like. The second one is to become a Vision Sports Ireland member. It's completely free. No monetary fee comes across. It's free to become a Vision Sports Ireland member. And within that, um, we ask people to register their interests. And that is point number three on this slide. Why register your interests? Well, it gives us a great idea how many people in Ireland want to do specific activities. So if you want to do a walking program in County Cork, you want to do kayaking and you're from Donegal, whatever part of the country you're from or whatever activities, you register those interests and it gives us more data to put on those activities where you're from. So you can put down more than one activity. You can put down as many activities as you like, and you don't have to be currently doing activity to register interest in that. So for example, I'm filling out my registration, register my interests, and I like the idea of kayaking, but I've never done it before. I can still put down kayaking and I will get informed when there's kayaking in my area. And lastly, uh, a most important step to get active is to join a club or an activity group. Again, this doesn't have to be with Vision Sports Ireland. This can be in your local community, whether it's with fighting blindness, whether it's your local um, community group in your own towns, villages, um, your local clubs. We do encourage people to get involved um, in a club or society. Um, there's peer support. There's more social interaction. It's fantastic. It gives people a, a, a good chance to get out and about, do your physical activity and enjoy it with others. Um, one question we do get asked um, within Vision Sports is, if I join a club, how do I know those coaches or volunteers are going to be able to adapt the sport for me and my level of vision? Well, that brings us on to education and training, where we have what's called our Vision Sports Awareness Training, where we educate coaches for how to adapt sports for somebody with a vision impairment. It's a very short one and a half hour workshop. Um, it goes through all the bases of colour contrasts, communication techniques. Again, I'm very happy to take that on after this stuff. So contact myself or any member of the Vision Sports Ireland team. Um, and how can we support you? So how can Vision Sports support our members and people all across the island of Ireland to get involved in sport and physical activity? Where well, we have a range of mainstream activities, these activities such as our tennis, um, such as our um, athletics programs, but also blind and vision impaired specific programs. Um, and this comes right across our, our blind golf programs, our tandem cycling, again, a specific for people who are, who are blind or vision impaired. Um, we do have a sport to fit everybody's needs, wants, and, and what they enjoy. 
Um, we also have the education and training piece. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that now. So division sports awareness training is our first one where we can train coaches and volunteers within clubs. So if you want to join an athletics club, you feel like I don't know or maybe the, the next coach never worked for somebody who's vision impaired before we can come in and educate the, the coaches and volunteers within that club we also have what's called a tandem pilot training course where we train pilots to become tandem pilots these happen all around the country our next one is in cork we have guide runner workshops so we've seen an image earlier um in the slide deck of a young man and a woman going for a walk or a run um and they had a tether so that would be guide running um would be the education piece on that this is very common in park runs there's park runs in nearly every town and village in Ireland. It's great to get involved as part of the community. Um, and if you do require anybody to, to learn how to become a guide, or if you want a guide to, to join in a park run or a next event, again, feel free to get in contact. And lastly, one thing we, that we do support is our home exercise series. So as myself, a, a man who has a vision impairment, I do know, and probably a lot of people are going through the same challenges of transport. There's not always transport links to all these community programs or programs in Dublin or programs in Cork. Sometimes the home exercise series is exactly what you're looking for. You can do it from the comfort of home um, and you don't need that transport link to get to, to a facility. So we have a number of, um, I suppose, programs in the home exercise series, whether it's movement, balance and strength or movement and stretch, I should say. So this is a fantastic, um, I suppose, program to make sure that um, all your joints, muscles, everything stay in tip top shape. Um, we also have our hit classes, high intensity work. We have our nature for nature mindfulness. Um, so we have a wide range of different home exercise series. These are delivered online through um, professional coaches um, on weekdays, both daytimes and evenings, whichever suits your agendas, your, your schedules. Again, feel free to get in contact with us after that. And lastly, what I'm going to say, I'm taking up a lot of time here on the course, is there is a very promising, a very exciting new program we're running called the I Can program. This is going to be delivered online with uh, exercise a practitioner, one-to-one -one sessions for six weeks where you can learn about the benefits of health and exercise, um, goal setting, nutrition, how to get active with the end goal of people doing this from the comfort of their own homes, but bring it on to a program at the end, so a physical activity program by the end of the six weeks. And lastly, I'm just going to share on screen now um, my contact details, our contact details within Vision Sports Ireland. So if you got a bit of inspiration from myself here this evening and you want to get involved in sporting or physical activities, you can contact us through Vision Sports at ncbi.ie. That's the email address, so Vision Sports ncbi.ie. You can call us or you can visit our website at www.visionsports.ie. We are on all social medias, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you back to Rachel. And thank you very much for, for listening to me here this evening. Hi, Sean. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, there really is a huge amount that people can get involved in and many different ways. It's brilliant to hear it. Um, so we will be sharing, like I said, we're recording, but we'll also share those details um, with everybody that has registered for the, the webinar. So just in case people didn't catch the email address and everything, that, that will be shared with everybody. Um, so yes, thanks to Moss there. I see your slides are up, so I'll leave you to it. Um, and yeah. Thanks very much, Rachel, and to everyone of Fight and Blindness for the invitation. Uh, to speak today and to all of you for attending and I hope to follow up on Sean's really inspirational uh, presentation with an overview of the care of patients with AMD regulated macular degeneration uh, currently and also looking a little bit to the future. These are my disclosures. I'm just going to chat a little bit about the disease itself, age-related macular degeneration, some of the symptoms that patients with AMD might experience uh, the assessments that we carry out, some of the imaging modalities we use to uh, investigate our patients, and then talk about the management options that we have available to us. So um, AMD, as many of you will know, is a chronic progressive condition, meaning that um, it's a, a long-term uh, diagnosis, and unfortunately, it can lead to irreversible central vision loss. So... I suppose in trying to understand the disease, if we look at the name of the condition, um, this helps us kind of identify some of the risk factors. So it's an age-related process, and this suggests that 
that we know that increasing age is really the main risk factor for this condition. Um, it's macular, so this means that it affects the macula. So what's the macula? Well, if we look at a fundus photo here, I'm showing a photo of the back of a patient's right eye. This uh, We can see that the area right in the center of that eye is the macula, and this is the part of our eye that gives us our fine uh, quality or fine definition vision, the vision we use for uh, reading or doing fine detail work. And this is the part of the eye that is affected in macular degeneration. Here we see a cross-sectional 3D OCT scan. So this is a scan that we use to assess patients, uh, many of our patients in, who come with retinal problems, but particularly important in age-related macular degeneration. And this allows us to look at the individual retinal layers and to try to identify if we can see wear and tear there, or if we can identify fluid or bleeding, which could be related to age-related macular degeneration. And as I said, degeneration is the last part of the name of AMD. And degeneration, as the name suggests, wear and tear or thinning out of the retina. And when that happens in the condition AMD, this is when we begin to get reductions in central vision, reduction in the quality of vision. Um, that's what our patients will often tell us. So there's two different types of AMD. Dry is by far and away the most common. And as its name suggests, dry, it means that there's an absence of fluid leak. Um, but the dry uh, degeneration suggests that there is wear and tear or thinning within the macula, which is responsible for cell uh, the cells being sick and unfortunately dying within that area. And that then leads to the central vision loss that patients will report in AMD. Much less commonly is the wet macular degeneration accounting for about 10% of cases of AMD. And in this, we can see patients having uh, acute changes in vision, which can be related to a bleed at the back of the eye, uh, related to um, blood vessel growth uh, within the macula, or sometimes there may be no bleeding, but there is leaking of fluid. And the OCT scan is really sensitive at detecting subtle leak um, of fluid underneath the retina and within the retinal layers, pointing to disease activity in AMD. Historically, we would use an angiogram to try to confirm the diagnosis of wet macular degeneration. And like any of you who may have had angiograms done for other conditions, perhaps heart disease, um, you'll know that an angiogram involves an injection of a dye and then a series of images are acquired. And it's not really any different in ophthalmology when we try to diagnose wet macular degeneration. But thankfully, technology has moved on and we're now able to use some non-contrast enhanced angiogram tests. Um, and this is something called OCT angiography, which by some clever uh, algorithmic work, we're able to follow the flow of blood through individual retinal vessels to identify abnormal blood vessel growth without the injection of a contrast dye, which is really beneficial for our patients and their experience in hospitals. Many of the imaging tests that we do involve patients sitting at uh, essentially a slit lamp type machine. So patients will often sit in a chair and their chin will rest on a chin rest and then uh, images will be taken of the eyes that can often be acquired in a matter of seconds. Sometimes the only thing that's uncomfortable is trying to keep focused on a particular target or if there's a bright flash of light when a particular photograph is being acquired. And when, uh, because, of the, uh, because of how easily our imaging can now be carried out and how relatively quick the imaging tests are, we're able to repeat these for our patients each time they attend so that we can build up a profile for each patient on their disease process and how they are responding to treatment and how their condition is progressing. But as I said, it's a complex disease process, age-related macular degeneration. We know that genetics are very important and therefore family history is very important. But also we now know that inflammation is really key in understanding how the condition uh, develops and progresses uh, with time in our patients.
AMD is a very common cause of vision loss um, and is one of the most common conditions that we see in the hospitals um, in Ireland and throughout the world. And we know that given that our patients are thankfully living ha uh, longer, healthier lives, that we can expect that the rates of age-related macular degeneration, both wet and dry, will increase over the coming 20 years. And it has been expected that between 2015 and 2035, that there may be as much as a 59 or 58% increase in the rates of those uh, conditions. So how would a patient know they have AMD? Well, they may have no symptoms, maybe picked up routinely when a patient perhaps attends an optometrist. Sometimes patients report that they feel they need more light to see uh, what they're doing. Um, and also patients can report particularly blurring of their central vision or difficulty reading. Sometimes people can be more specific and say that I have trouble recognizing people's faces. Um, and this can be, again, if you think back to our uh, discussion about the disease process itself, this is because we use our macula, our central part of our uh, retinas, to see the fine detail of patients' faces. However, sometimes it's not an entirely central area. Sometimes people can also report patchiness of their vision in the area around the central vision. And as I said, patients may also report difficulty with reading. Some of you may have been given something called an Amsler grid, which is a tool that we use to try to identify distortion, um, which is when you look at a straight line, uh, does the straight line appear bendy or wobbly? And this is a tool that can be sometimes is given to patients um, in an effort to uh, facilitate patients in carrying out self-monitoring of their condition to determine if things are stable or if they're getting worse with time. And what's really important for us, particularly if we're following up a patient with dry macular degeneration and we want to see if they've converted to wet macular degeneration, it will be if the patient reports a sudden change in their vision, a sudden reduction in vision, a sudden onset of distortion, then those things we would hope would prompt a patient to seek um, an eye health professional review because it may indicate the treatment is required. So what management strategies have we? Well, um, following on really from Sean's uh, discussion about exercise, you know, lifestyle advice, you know, is so important. Avoiding smoking because smoking drives inflammation within the body. So smoking is certainly a risk factor for AMD and encouraging physical activity is, is really important. And there is research evidence that shows that it can have a positive impact on AMD. Diet is important, um, adherence to a particular Mediterranean uh, type diet uh, slows progression. Um, unfortunately, this also involves only moderate consumption of fish and wine, I have to say. Um, however, it has been shown that if you have a very strong family history, so if genetic factors are present in a patient, increasing the risk of AMD, then the effect of diet um, has been kind of reduced. I should say the positive effect of a good diet um, is reduced in terms of its effect on AMD progression. Many of you may well be aware of the role of particular supplements um, and the number of different branded supplements available. The really important thing is that the supplements contain um, the ARADS2 formulation. And this, the ARADS2 was a particular clinical trial that ran um, looking at age-related eye disease. And it was identified that a certain combination of vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, and copper, and some macular pigments, lutein and zeaxanthine, was shown to reduce the rate of progression of AMD um, and this is something that we would certainly advocate to many of our patients who come to us um, with AMD, provided their condition is sufficiently advanced. So, the, so just to summarize there, the generic advice that I give to patients is, you know, stop smoking, exercise, consider diet. And if there are certain features present within the person's eye, that would suggest that we know from research that they would benefit from using macular supplements and I would recommend the ARADS2 formulation. Unfortunately, there is no evidence that taking supplements will prevent or postpone the development of AMD. However, many patients want to do absolutely anything they can to try to prevent the development of AMD or prevent the progression of AMD. 
And my generic and my general advice is, well, at the very worst, you're not going to be doing yourself any harm. But sometimes we can't always say that based on the available research data that there is going to be a definite benefit. And the difficulty, of course, with taking supplements is that you're trying to prevent something from happening. So it's very difficult for a, an individual patient to be aware of the benefit that the supplements are having and therefore I can understand then why it is difficult to commit to a lifelong treatment. In terms of specific treatments, you know, recently a drug, uh, the first drug has become available, um, a licensed medication for the treatment of age-related macular degeneration. And this is very exciting, PEG set up a plan. Um, and it is, it, this has shown the reduction in the rate of the development of geographic atrophy. And this was licensed in the US and it has been submitted for approval in Europe as well. So we'll watch this space and hopefully this will become available um, to our patients. And this drug will work by an intravitreal injection. So similar to wet age related macular degeneration treatments, it will work um, by injections into the eye and it works by blocking inflammation and so blocking disease progression. A number of other treatments are currently in the I suppose research stage both um you know internationally um some of these looking at the gene therapies and this applies both for wet and dry age-related macular degeneration just to say gene therapy uh, in brief is uh, involves an operation on the eye usually and uh, to take out the jelly within the eye and then an injection of a particular virus that has been modified to contain a particular um a gene which allows a particular protein to be manufactured by the eye itself but this operation involves an injection of fluid under under the retina uh, so it is not so it is a relatively invasive treatment and as i said as yet gene therapy and stem cell replacements um which are also being investigated and particularly over the last uh, couple of decades, really the focus on these has really increased, but as yet these are not available um, in widespread for clinical use. However, they are certainly uh, very active in terms of research. Gene therapy really, I suppose, will be looking at slowing down and hopefully stopping disease progression, while stem cell replacement may actually allow us to reverse some of the vision loss that patients experience from conditions such as age-related macular degeneration. There are some other treatments which are exciting and are being rolled out, um, and I suppose active research being carried out in them to try to understand why they work and how they may work, and if they apply uh, benefit for all patients. One of these is photobiomodulation, which would involve a particular type of light treatment where lights of different wavelengths are shown on the back of the eye. And in some studies, these have been shown to um, uh, improve vision and reduce progression of AMD. Um, however, you know, as with all of the newer available treatments, additional research is required to really validate and show how generalizable the benefits are for our patients and which patients benefit most from these treatments. Wet AMD treatments, you know, many of you may well be aware of these treatments. They're, you know, um, have evolved a lot over the past 20 years and have been profoundly beneficial for patients. Um, we even in 2022 had the addition of a new treatment, um, Vibismo or Farisimab, to the um, types of drugs that we have available to us for treating macular, uh, wet macular degeneration. These drugs are in general administered only via injection, but we know a clear benefit. Uh, here we can see some of the earlier clinical trials for one of the drugs, Lucentis, which showed that patients who got injections with Lucentis improved vision, while unfortunately those patients who did not receive treatment lost vision over the course of a couple of years. Irrespective of how intravitreal injections are given, there are different protocols. You know, patients used to attend once a month and decisions would be made every month whether or not they got a treatment. Nowadays, patients tend to transition over onto treat and extend regimes, which is where a patient gets an injection um, at every visit. But we hope that if the disease is stable, that they can increase the interval between their injections. But the really important thing, irrespective of the type of treatment 
uh, pathway or protocol that you're on, it is very important to keep up with treatment and review appointments because we do unfortunately have relatively high non-attendance rates for our intravitreal injection treatment uh, slots, um, which are so valuable. Um, and so, and without keeping up with the treatment slots and for, with the treatment visits, um, we know that vision can be lost with time. A lot of research is going on, you know, and to try to come up with better ways, more acceptable ways for our patients to be treated so that they can reduce the number of visits in hospital and reduce the number of treatments that they require. One of these is the port delivery system with one of these anti-VEGF or intravitreal drugs. And this would involve placing a little reservoir within the eye and then that this reservoir can be topped up maybe as infrequently as once every six months or even less, depending on the patient's response. And again, as I mentioned before, both gene therapy and stem cell replacements are also being uh, trialed and investigated for wet macular degeneration. So the holy grail of treatments for AMD really would be a cure where we would have effective stabilization of the macular uh, degeneration so that the patient can get long lasting lifelong benefit. We would hope that it would be minimally invasive for our patients and that it would be affordable. So... Um, and finally, just to mention telescopes, um, there's, uh, these are available. There's currently a clinical trial being run by one of my colleagues, Professor David Keegan at the Matter Hospitals. And I've included his, the phone number for uh, his office. Um, they're continuing to recruit patients for the telescope uh, lens uh, trial. And I can leave this, uh, my slides, and of course, the contact information if you require further information on this um, or would wish to be considered for suitability um, for that trial. That's not, a, I suppose, a cure for the macular degeneration, but where patients have been particularly stable, um, it may require or uh, provide some visual rehabilitation. Um, and this treatment is being provided, is being done as a, a post-marketing clinical trial uh, for this particular type of um, uh, telescopic lens. So thank you very much. Hi, Tomas. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Sorry, it's a bit, a bit bright there. Um, yeah, that was brilliant. I think a really comprehensive overview of AMD. And I, I know a lot of people on the call will really benefit from that presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so we do have time for questions at the end. Um, so I will be coming back to you, uh, Tomas, I'm sure, with questions from um, some of our attendees. So moving on, um, I'm going to introduce Martha O'Connor and Catherine Sinnott, who were members of Fighting Blindness, the support team. So Martha and Catherine, do you want to turn on your cameras and your unmute yourselves? Yeah, I can't turn on my camera. Um, the yeah, host yeah. has stopped it. So I think, Rachel, you may have to do it oh, on yeah. your side. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, I'm finding this webinar very informative. Um, my name is Marta O'Connor and I'm a new head of support services in fighting blindness. Um, so myself and Katrin are joining today just to briefly, briefly tell you about what we can offer within fighting blindness. Um, I think kind of listening to this webinar, I was fascinated how much is already being done and and you know all the research updates um on trying to find the cure for amd um, and as a psychologist i know that it can be a journey to find the cure can be a little bit frustrating it can be can be upsetting can be just difficult um so what we do offer in fighting blindness is um different range of support services um so First of, of all, we do offer free of charge um, counseling service to anyone who is affected by visual impairment, as well as their family members, because it is a journey which you often um, kind of have with your family members. So it's not only for people who are affected by visual impairment, but for the family members. It's a free of charge service so if anyone would like to avail of of counseling and just have that space to speak about it and speak about their 
experience and um, have have the moment just for themselves. Um, you are more than welcome to make a contact with us, and um, hopefully we will be able to 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 support you in in it. Um, and also, apart from the counseling services, what we offer in fighting blindness is a number of different support groups. Um, and Katrin is our um, support group coordinator who will tell you a little bit more about very exciting new groups coming up. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's a great resource we are very proud of. So I will hand it over to Katrin and she can tell you a little bit more about it. Great, thank you, Marta. Yeah, so um, the AMD's peer support group, um, we had our first session of that yesterday. Um, so it's our newest peer support group and we're very excited about it. It runs on the third Tuesday of the month uh, from three until half four. So this group and also along with all of our other groups, they take place on Zoom um, and this allows us to reach people on a national level. Um, and don't worry if you've never used Zoom before or have limited experience, uh, we're here to help you with that. So um, just feel free to tell us. Um, so our AMD group, it's free to attend. You don't need to be a member of Fighting Blindness. Uh, the group is open to men and women. It is there to support those of you who are living with age-related macular degeneration. Um, we understand that receiving a diagnosis can be overwhelming, to say the least. Um, you may experience a range of feelings that can affect you and your family. So whilst attending this peer support group, participants can give and receive support on issues that they may have in common and also share coping skills. Uh, we have found that our peer support groups can be a place where new friendships can develop and the groups can be empowering for uh, the participants. Confidentiality is of utmost importance and the AMD support group provides a safe space for people to share. Just to say the places are limited and just to note that whilst the group can be therapeutic in nature um, these peer support groups are not formal group therapy. Um, we will be sending out an information leaflet to you about the AMD group um, and, and the contact information will be on that for how you can join. Um, also, just to mention, as Marta said, we have a range of support groups um, that go from mindfulness to technology clubs to gardening clubs. So um, you can actually find more information on these on our website. It's fightingblindness.ie. And you just need to go to the how we can help section and click on support. Um, and that's basically it. And you can email about the groups, insight groups at fightingblindness.ie. And I'll be happy to give you any information that you require. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Martha. Um, and like Catherine said, we will be sending around a leaflet with information um, on the AMD support group in particular. Um, but you can visit our website for more information. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I know I we did send out a link to um, an AMD survey that we asked if you had time that you could complete. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over uh, the what we found or what came out of the survey, because I feel like it's very interesting. Um, so, no, sorry, let's get to the survey. Um, so it was very high level. It was actually only one question. So um, I'm not sure if we can actually probably class it as a survey, but I suppose fighting blindness, one of our key uh, focuses now is in AMD, along with inherited retinal diseases. So as an organization, we really wanted to find out more about what it's like uh, for people living with AMD and in particular the barriers that um, people face when they're living with AMD. So the survey results, 28 people completed the survey and thank you very much if you're one of those people. Um, and the results, uh, people could select up to three barriers that they felt that they faced um, living with AMD. And you can see on the right there, the graph, but I suppose the top three barriers um, First was negative impact on day-to-day -day activities, followed by lack of information available, uh, followed by no treatment available. Um, followed by this, we had um, negative impact on mental health, difficulties getting to and from treatment appointments, negative impact on social life. Uh, there was another um, other button that people could select um, and long waiting times for appointments. 
And then this is followed by lack of psychological supports, frequency of treatment appointments and negative impact on employment. Um, so like I said, this is just a snapshot of maybe an insight into what it, um, the barriers that are faced by people living with AMD. We know it's not comprehensive, um, but we do think that it's very interesting. And what we are hoping to do now is have this inform kind of our planning around how we can help people living with AMD. And part of that is the support groups. And part of that will be how research, because um, Fighting Blindness also funds research and is a research charity, how research can incorporate this feedback into our planning around our um, our plans for AMD. Um, and there was a comment section. Uh, so let it be noted, we have seen those comments. And again, we will take them on board. But I, a lot of it was around, I suppose, the loss of independence. Um, and really the day-to-day -day activities like not being able to read the newspaper um, and also the lack of information and we hope actually today's webinar is a beginning to um, trying to give people more information on um, AMD. So I will send the link around after as well as part of the email uh, if anyone else wants to complete it and wants to do that that would be great. Um, and it may change some of the results, but I think it is it is very interesting and of great use to us at Finding Blindness. So thank you very much. Um, so with that, I think we'll move on to questions. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I might invite Tomas and Sean to um, join us back for the questions. Um, so we did have some people submit questions beforehand. So I'm gonna to go to those first. And actually, Tomas, I think you covered some of them already in your presentation. Um, but we did we had a question come in about scarring. Um, so this person has scarring at the back of their eyes, and they're wondering is there research being carried out uh, to try and cure this? Um, or are there any current remedies to lessen this scarring? Thanks, Rachel. Um, I mean it's a very good question. You know, scarring is unfortunately, I suppose, the end stage um, of what happens after, you know, somebody has had um, wet macular degeneration, perhaps that has maybe not responded to treatment. Um, and it's like any scar, even on your skin, if you think about it, it's not possible to really undo the scar once it has developed. Really, prevention is, is, is better than cure. Um, so for this, you know, there, there is ongoing work and research in trying to come up with ways of regenerating tissue. So to kind of work around the scars, so that would be where kind of stem cell replacement, you know, would come into it. And that would apply for any of the conditions that affect the macula. But in terms of when that will be available, you know, for all of our patients, you know, I mean, the short answer is not soon enough, but in reality, when that will be we as yet don't have the answer. The big thing, you know, just to go back to what I said earlier on, is just to try to prevent getting to that, both through, you know, us and the, us as professionals trying to improve the capacity that we have for our patients so the patients are seen in a timely manner. And so that when they're kind of prescribed treatment, that they get their treatments on time. And we're doing kind of a lot of work to try to improve all of that. But then it also, you know, I think one of, in your survey, you kind of hit, you know, it was quite stark. Some of the problems that people have is getting to hospital, you know, the, the burden of all of the treatments that we have, the intravitreal injections, you know, for wet macular generation, it's not, unfortunately, a long term cure and it requires a lot of it, it's a big burden for the patients. But if I could encourage, you know, any of our patients who are prescribed those treatments that they only work when they're delivered regularly and in the time period that we want to try to prevent the development of scarring because once the scarring happens we can't really undo it okay thanks Moss. and i might just ask leading off that you mentioned stem cell therapy there and i know you mentioned in your talk as well so that's i suppose there's a question in around stem cell therapy and this person i think believes that it's available in England and in Europe, but I know that's not the case. It actually isn't available. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, 
It's a very, yeah, it's a very personal question. I mean, you know, clinical trials are certainly ongoing. Um, they're very early stage clinical trials in general, and they're very small numbers of patients that are recruited. Um, and patients who are included in those studies, you know, are have often gone through kind of a rigorous, you know, process to be included but also those people running those clinical trials have to make sure that they meet certain eth you know obviously the ethics of those trials and that they're the science all stacks up you know there are a lot of um kind of advertisements of various stem cell treatments available kind of not just in europe and in the us um but you know I would have to kind of urge caution to anybody who would consider any of those treatments which promise a cure or, um, you know, a, a treatment because, you know, I, I would have to question if those treatments have been validated, if they've a lot of research behind them and if they're fundamentally safe, let alone effective. Yeah, I think we would, we would agree with that as well. To be very cautious around the clinics. Um, but I know it does it does represent a great potential of dental cell therapy, so it's definitely something to keep an eye on for the future. Um, so Sean, we just got a question in around um, a person who said that they played golf, um, but now with their AMDs, they're finding it difficult. Is golf something that you can help a person with in a vision in sports Ireland? Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, absolutely. So we get quite a number of people looking to get involved in golf, especially people who play golf throughout their lifetime and then acquire a vision impairment later in life. Um, so we do. Um, we've great links with Irish Blind Golf, but also we have some Vision Sports Ireland golf programs running ourselves. Um, there's a fantastic program running out of the Midlands at the moment, but also we can pair up sighted guides with golfers. Um, so it's a caddy as such. So it's just um usually it's a friend or family member, somebody to play somebody that that person has already played golf with beforehand. Um, that would be a sighted caddy going around the golf course with them. So it's not that you'd have to come to a vision sport specific event. However, we do run them and we'd like if you'd like to get involved. I'm sure it's blind golf would be the very same. But um this person, I'm sure a member of a golf club have been playing before, have their own friends, their whole social groups. So we can look at training up your a friend or a family member to be a caddy such as sighted guide training um, and our vision sports awareness training. So if this person would like to get in contact with myself or even to yourself, Rach, and you can reach out to me afterwards, we can get in contact and, and get this process in place to get a caddy for this, this person. Brilliant. Thanks, Sean. Um, and, and then, then we, we just have a question, question in for either Catherine or Mark. I know, I think you mentioned it, but do you need to be a member of Finding Linus to join uh, something like the AMD group? No, no, it's the support groups are free to everybody that they can join and you do not need to take out membership for fighting blindness. And it will be the same with the counselling services as well. You don't have to be a member to be able to avail of the services. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I know we have a few minutes, so I might go back to yourself, Tomas. Um, so I know you mentioned information is obviously huge in AMD. So is the research being undertaken on the role of anti-inflammatories in the treatment of AMD? Yeah, so I suppose the short answer is yes. I guess it depends on what, what is meant by anti-inflammatory. So I suppose even the the light the newly licensed medications for the treatment of dry macular degeneration they all work by targeting various parts of the inflammation pathway to try to really slow down inflammation in the eye um, and there are also some systemic treatments that are being considered and trialed even certain types of antibiotics that may have side effects for want of a better word which also improve inflammation in terms of medications like steroids or like your over-the-counter ibuprofen, which are anti-inflammatories as well, there's no evidence that I'm aware of um, that they cause a, a positive effect, I suppose, in the inflammation in the eye. Now, we do use steroids and we use anti-inflammatories for the treatments of certain types of inflammation in the eye, like uveitis or scleritis. 
but that would be a different disease process than age-related macular degeneration. And so uh, as such, those types of medications have not been shown to have a role in treating or delaying um, age-related macular degeneration. Great, thank you. Um, and just, I suppose that there's another question that we got in, but I think you covered it as well, the new uh, drug for ge geographic atrophy. So that isn't available in Ireland at the moment. It's, yes, so it's been, it's licensed in America. I think like 100,000 doses of the drug have been given. Um, and it has been shown in clinical trial data to reduce the rates of progression of this atrophy. Um, so it's very, very promising. It's very exciting that there is a licensed drug available somewhere worldwide. Um, you, when and how it will be licensed in Europe is yet to be confirmed. Um, but obviously, if it's licensed in, in Europe, then that will apply in Ireland. And then it will be how the medication becomes available to to our patients um because obviously we it would be wonderful you know to have it available to patients who need it um in a, in a timely manner um so that that is would yet of course have to be worked out etc um and would involve you know various i suppose lobbying etc with government etc in terms of how it would be funded etc yeah. Um, and the medication itself would be given much in the same way of wet as wet macular degeneration is treatment treated with regular injections into the eye. Um, so again, those similar types of kind of comments, you know, from from patients are really important. How patients will get to their appointments, uh, regular visits, etc. Um, those things will all be important and mm -hmm. really important that we try to deliver care for our patients as best we can. Great, thank you. And I just might another question from Tomas, and um, I know we're just at the end, so apologies if we didn't get your question. Um, again, you also covered it around supplement, so supplements. So this person is taking Mackey Prime Plus, um, and they kind of their vision. They've been taking it, but they for several years, but their vision has continued to worsen. So I guess it comes back to your point around that. You know, people can take these, but it might necessarily um, lead to an improvement or stop progression. Yeah, exactly. So I suppose, well, first things first is, you know, the, the basics. I mean, okay, the macula can have macular degeneration, but are your glasses up to date? If you have you been to the optician, you know, is there development of cataract? There are other issues that may also be affecting the vision. So that would be, you know, something I'm sure the patient has addressed, but it's something to consider as well. Um, and the difficulty, you know, just with the macular, with the supplements is you're trying, you know, to prevent or slow down something. Um, it's kind of like taking blood pressure tablets, you know, you you take them for years and years and you never see the benefit you, you feel you don't have any benefit from them and um, mm -hmm. but you know the, the reverse is we know from research data that without taking those that somebody let's say if they don't take the blood pressure tablets they're more likely to develop a stroke or heart attack and we know that if you have relatively advanced age related macular degeneration and you take your supplement that you can reduce the rates of progression by as much as 25 percent over the course of five years but that may still mean that there is some progression of the condition, unfortunately. So it's all about doing those other things, you know, making sure that you're active, that you've good diet, that you're trying to stop smoking. If you do, um, all of those things are, are, are really beneficial and making sure then that, you know, the other parts of the eye are looked after your glasses are up to date. You've good lighting at home that you avail of available technologies um, you know, because there's lots of things available outside of the things that we can do as doctors and mm -hmm. nurses and optometrists that can make a huge difference to people's lives, like, you know, an iPad or a mobile phone where you can enlarge the text, I think has done more for patients with dry macular degeneration that I'll probably do in my entire career, you know. Mm. Right. Thanks so much. So I think we'll wrap up there. And um, just to say thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, and thank you for everyone that joined. Um, I know I've said a few times, but we will be sending around the link to this, the recording of this webinar 
um, and include information uh, for Vision Sports Ireland. And we might just pull out the information about that trial to Mosa. You spoke about the telescopic. So the people have that too. Um, and the um, leaflet around support in the AMD support group. Um, and also the link to the survey. So with that, yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, I think it was really informative. And I think uh, people would have learned a lot. And there's a lot of hope there as well for treatments in the future and things that, you know, are very close and, you know, might be in the next few years that they're in Ireland, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, thank you, everybody. And thanks again for joining. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.